This is Lorenzo Pupillo. Lots of people. Can you hear me? Yes, hi Lorenzo. This is John Kern, I'm here. We've got the list showing, so everybody to chime in, although the, I guess the ISOC, people are viewing through ISOC, we don't know them or... Uh, I see we have a distinguished guest. I see Bob Hinden, who's the current chair of ISOC, is here. So we should... Give him a recognition, and I'll make okay. a point of mentioning. All right, Let, let's uh, let's get started. Here it's twelve o'clock. We want to do this um, in uh, two hours or less. So, uh, welcome. Can you see me? All right. I'm Ellie Noam. I'm the director of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, and I also hear a lot of muting of of echoes. Um, I'm a professor at the Columbia Business School. Um, and uh, as a host, uh, kind of host, uh, Dave, who is the organizer right, sitting right next to me, uh, is um, put me at the front end. Uh, we're bookended perhaps by Milton Mueller, whose article uh, on Montevideo got us started on thinking and discussing this. Thank you very much, Milton. And thank, thank you in particular, Dave, who put the program together. They've tried very hard to uh, have a balanced participation. So if you're missing somebody, an organization, a country, a perspective, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, we wanted everyone here within reason, of course, but not everyone wanted to go public. Uh, so here we are, and we're going to talk about, uh, there have been a lot of meetings, uh, US, UN, Dubai, Bali, Baku. Uh, there's a whole internet governance industry out there uh, we, at Columbia, we've had Hamadun Touré uh, two years in a row. We've had Larry Sritling. You know all the arguments. Some are re reputable, some are conventional, some are conventional anti-American with a tech veneer. I've heard uh, Robert Mugabe extol internet freedom, freedom from America. And on the other side are those who think that the status quo is just fine. Thank you. So we're determined here not to repeat those arguments, or at least to minimize them. Uh, instead, we want to brainstorm to see what the new ideas are, what new options there are, um, and uh, we'll discuss them here today, or at least try to discuss them. And so I'd like kind of to pass on the microphone to uh, Dave Burstein, who put this together. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah. Milton Mueller is the one who got this started. Bob Atkinson saw his note there and said we should do something about it. And I agreed, and Ellie looked at me and said, would you do it? And I think we've got some interesting people here. Okay, on my slides up? Yes, they are. Okay, is there a third way for the Internet? Neither the U.S. nor the U.N., but independence. How do I advance the slide, Jason? Okay. Okay, we're going to open up with Ellie Noam. Uh, I look around the room I'm in here at CITI, and all I seem to see are books with Ellie Gnome's name on it. The odds are that anything you thought of and wonder in this field, Ellie discussed usually a decade before you thought of it. It gets rather annoying. He's the leading public intellectual in communications literally around the world. Ellie has been talking about the federated internet, and he'll, I'll let him tell you there. John Curran of Aaron is up after that. John is one of the signers of Montevideo. He's got a very strong technical background. And I asked him to start by looking at the technical aspects of what Ellie is saying and whether that works and then go where he's going. Renzo Papilio is with Telecom Italia. He's a senior economist. He's been in the middle of things for years. Alejandro Pasante of Mexico is a former mem board member of ISOC, is on one of the key advisory committees of ICANN, also an expert. Milton at uh, the University of Syracuse has written a book or two on this stuff, and he is sure to have provocative things to say. Fred Goldstein had some ideas, and Bob said listen to them, and I'm sure they're going to be worth listening to when we get to him. We split the world last December in Dubai. It was the U.S. and their allies versus the BRICS and more. One of the most prominent people in, in this discussion looked me in the eye in Dubai when I was wondering, why are we fighting so hard? And he said, do you want Russia and China to run the Internet? 
My take is being overly dramatic, and that's not really what this is about, but that's the kind of thing we're going to be hearing. Ellie introduced his federated internet proposal in June at a state of telecom conference. We had Amadun Touré of the ITU and Larry Strickling, who in the U.S. government supervises ICANN, at that conference. Lots of thoughts. In Montevideo on October 7th, John Curran, who's on the call, the head of ISOC, the head of ICANN, the rest of the registries, got together and put out a very important statement. In it, they talked about globally coherent Internet operations, warned against fragmentation at a national level, spoke of the undermining of trust because of the security issues there, and of the globalization of ICANN and Internet governance, which now is under the nominal control of the U.S., very lightly exercised. Milton came in and wrote... Excuse me, did someone speak up? No. Okay. Milton jumped in and wrote, the core institutions were abandoning the U.S. government. I don't know if that's really how it plays out. Among other things, we, we heard from the U.S. Assist Ambassador Danny Sepulveda that he supports what was said at Montevideo. So what is going on? I certainly don't know. And that's why I'm very happy to be here and hearing from people who know more than I do. Will I can split from the U.S. to a contract with you instead of a contract with the U.S. government? Three elephants in the room. The first is that the Internet grew up in the United States and Europe. But in the chart I just put on the screen, that big blue area is the Asia-Pacific Internet in a few years. The U.S. and European Internet is smaller than the one in Africa. Obviously, the folks in Asia and the rest of the world wonder why the U.S. has such a role. The second, which is close to my heart, is what the folks at the ITU believe, that they have to connect the world and bring this wonderful internet to everybody. And somebody there will please go on mute. Thank you. Uh, and that that should be at the heart of Wicket, the discussion, and of what internet governance should enable. Lots of people think that they're off the wall. And what we're not going to discuss about in particular today is the huge issue that's actually inspired most of this discussion, security now brought to the fore by Snowden. It's not that Columbia is not delighted to discuss that issue, or any of us are uncomfortable with it. It's rather that Columbia is working on another event that's going to concentrate on that. And with that, let me head it out, hand it back to Ellie Nome. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, what I'd like to kind of to say. There's been a lot of discussion here, obviously. And so now the question is, will the uh, internet to its ICANN institutions and related institutions in effect declare independence of some sort, uh, maybe with some uh, governance system, some incorporation as an independent nonprofit uh, incorporated maybe in the United States or somewhere else. And that's probably in some direction in which things are going. But clearly that's only temporary because there are several issues. One of them is the governance of that arrangement itself. Uh, uh, once you have a monopoly type system, monopolies tend to become lazy, fat, and non-innovative, and there's absolutely no reason why an ICANN-based system will not become that way. Already now we've had personal experiences with arrogance by the ICANN. Uh, that is astonishing in my view. Uh, and it convinces me that self-restraint and self-regulation will simply not work. They never do. So you think there will be an outside board and the board will control, but I don't think that's going to happen either. Uh, truly independent board boards um, do not really exist easily, and if they do, they become highly politicized. So I think that that's probably going to defeat itself too. So therefore... Um, one has to start thinking about arrangements that are non-uniform, that are competitive, that through the discovery mechanism of, of competition and rivalry, establish 
uh, better alternatives. And I know that technologists kind of uh, at this point protest uh, because they truly believe and love uniformity. It's part of the culture. Um, but but um, governments, of course, love uniformity too. Um, but there are some real advantages, and those are the disadvantages of dynamic innovation. So people have been talking about a after die about a digital cold war, uh, and kind of thought of this as calamitous. Uh, but some people said, well, maybe it's calamitous, but at least it's unavoidable. Regretfully, but I will kind of go one step further and say it's actually a good thing to have more than one uniform internet system one more standardized system. There could be multiple arrangements, technologically diverse, with some bridging institution in between, uh, not necessarily by country or regionally based, but also company based, technology based. And yes, there will be some innovation, uh, some, some problems of uh, nonconformity here, but that exists in lots of other technologies too. The internet uniformity was good in its early stages. It worked well. It was kind of a bunch of technology gurus who who did this, um, but that was then, and now is now, and the future is different. Internet folks are really good about talking about disruption and how the internet disrupts everything, and that creates dynamism, and it's good, and it does nice things in the music industry and whatever. But why should not? Why should not the same disruption apply to the internet itself? Um, uh, where people then go blind is to see that a force similar to the one that disrupts other industries upends the industry itself. So I say, internet, go disrupt yourself. Um, to oppose fundamental change here is actually truly conservative, uh, which is why some of the internet ideology is truly conservative when it comes to itself. We like it just the way it is, or was, just more of it. Um, now, of course, this will be denied with the defensiveness that matches the defensiveness of the music industry. It will be argued, actually, there's a lot of things happening. Look at IPv6, at the domain name system. Sure, people fight over these issues, but these are pixels in the larger picture. Uh, and another way to deal with this is to uh, envelop everything in a thick fog of geek speak and the minutiae of international bodies, task forces, standards committees, trade treaties, etc., etc. This is obfuscation. It does not enlighten. The issues actually are not that complicated when you strip them down. On the one hand, there is the belief system that the internet system, the fundamental system of interconnectivity and operability needs to be uniform. Without such uniformity, it would break apart. That's one view. Um, and, uh, but there are very few things that we do the same way around the world, or even within a sim same country. What is more surprising to me, actually, is that we had a system that was uniform at all. What we experienced in Dubai, I think, is a return to normal. And it is probably just the beginning of fragmentation. And there are earnest and well-meaning efforts to bridge these uh, divergences, and more power to all of you who do that. Uh, they may succeed for a time. Uh, but the reality is that the world is a multifaceted place, lots of countries, lots of companies, lots of technology, and the Internet is part of the world. And this will happen even more so in the future. Now, will it happen on the level of the public Internet? Maybe not at first, but there are private Internet IP systems, uh, private IP platforms, and they will interconnect with each other through commercial uh, peer arrangements, uh, they will kind of find their own ways, find their own protocols. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what's wrong with that, actually? Not only is it inevitable, but in the future, such a diversification is actually a good thing. The Internet governance system, let's face it, is not proceeding at Moore's Law speed. Uh, technology is moving fast, but if you want to change something in the Internet, how are you going to do this? So a steering committee of the engineering task force, it's a small group, I think 15 or so engineers, almost all of them are employees of big companies. Um, most of them, I think, are men. Um, and um, if you want to have an innovation uh, and want to make a change in Internet protocols and the sacred text of the TCP IP, you must go through this group, and this takes time and politics if it ever happens. It's not a system of openness and discovery for competition.
interpretation. It's a system of a group of essentially internally self-appointed wise men. A brilliant new idea must be approved in an administrative system that might be purely on the merits, but it might also balance the perspective of the various major companies as sponsors of the delegates. Would the two Hawaii delegates out of 15 on that board easily approve a change that might disadvantage investments made already by their company? Why is this a good system? Perhaps it was so in the early years when the creation of critical mass was essential and economic interests were relatively small, but today, doesn't the system actually retard innovation? And so, uh, to conclude then, um, what is likely to evolve in my view, it will take obviously a few years, but we should start thinking in these terms, a uniform system would evolve into a more diverse system, a federation or a confederation of interconnected systems with different technologies and different operating arrangements that coexist, that collaborate, in some forms, sometimes compete and sometimes uh, work against each other. An internet of internet, if you wish. And how does that affect the post Dubai ITU discussion? Uh, first, it would take a lot of the questions out of any type of supranational governance. Uh, if standards need to be not to be uniform, why fight, why fight over them? And even more, why fight over who can set these unessential standards? And this lowers the anxiety level considerably. It will keep high-tech countries and industries uh, happy. So I think the ITU in that future should be more about IT and less about you, less about union and uniformity. It should do technical recommendations, which will keep the developing world happy, um, but it, um, uh, the unhappy party probably would be the internet purists. For them, the ideal is arrangement of situation where they are, they are the arbiters on internet matters between America on the one hand and Russia and China and the Arabs on the other hand, they would lose that leverage. Um, and the internet purists will long for the golden age in which a bunch of computer science professors and researchers got together and changed the world. That system should be celebrated, but it should not be worshipped. And seen in such a light, we have before us a creative opportunity rather than an intractable problem. Instead of banging our heads against the wall trying to achieve a uniformity which will uh, satisfy nobody in a process that will get everybody crazy, we should find arrangements where different systems can coexist and that should be the international agenda for the next few years on internet matters. Thank you. Ellie, thanks very much for that. that as usual, it was extraordinary and unexpected. And I wouldn't have even thought of things this way until you put them out, which is great. Anybody out there want to put, open up the first question before we go to John Curran? OK. I'll give uh, getting the quick question and Ellie. How would this actually work? Somebody who's going to run what and who's going to make sure the interconnection is robust, which it needs to be for this to work. The key institution would bridges. be bridges. Uh, bridging institutions, and they could be uh, independent companies, or there could be parts of existing internet arrangements, or there could be, in fact, there could be ITU-sponsored bridges, or there could be ICANN-sponsored bridges, but there would be translating institutions that uh, would kind of bridge between different arrangements to the extent that they don't um, interoperate themselves uh, easily and conveniently. Okay. I want to bring on John Curran next because he's run a large network. He worked at BBN creating the Internet as we know it. And he's now in the middle of the system, running the North American Registry. John, are you ready? Thank you. And I'm honored uh, to follow uh, Eli Nome's remarks um, regarding a federated Internet. Um, I guess it's important to realize that um, there's certainly uh, some truth to the fact that we don't need to have a globally synchronized consistent internet. And I think that aspiring for such um, is, does sell the internet short. The internet is a revolutionary technology. 
and it has caused revolutionary changes. And uh, much as he suggests, there's a great question as to whether or not uh, we should be capable of watching the internet um, in, evolve itself in a revolutionary way. Uh, to some extent, the Montevideo statement um, supports uh, those sorts of views, uh, but there is a slightly different twist on it. And I guess the word that we use in the Montevideo statement was globally coherent internet operations. Globally coherent means it all will work together. And that's important. Um, unlike uh, many other systems, um, the internet provides a, a synergy, network economies and synergy that are of a massive scale, so much that the importance of the internet in uh, human development and social and economic development has become uh, a very important force. One we don't want to lose. We don't want to lose the value of a synergistic network that connects so many people together by going to a federated network where these people may have um, independent or unreliable, not coherent connectivity. And globally coherent isn't lockstep. Globally coherent, much like we have globally coherent roads and highways, you may find a bicycle, a motorcycle, an automobile, a delivery van, all on the highway. The highway wasn't designed specifically for any one of them, but carries a wide range. We need the same thing for the internet. And there does need to be enough commonality that the internet hangs together. And so uh, we actually, in the Montevideo statement for the future of internet cooperation, we did reinforce the importance of a globally coherent internet. Um, that doesn't mean something globally synchronized. It does allow diversity, diversity of applications, diversity of how uh, individual organizations run their portions of it commercial transactions, but enough coherence to get the network synergy that has made the internet the crucial force that it is. We also think, particularly when it comes to internet governance challenges and uh, working towards better cooperation uh, in keeping the internet running, there is a need now for the internet to pick up the pace of change. It is true that we have maintained the same mechanism for in some cases, decades on end. And um, uh, while we have all seen initiatives, uh, such as the uh, IGF out of the WISIS initiative, um, we haven't seen a remarkable change in terms of how some of these key structures are coordinated. So we did call for acceleration of the globalization of ICANN and the IANA functions, okay? So it's an environment where everyone can participate including all governments on an equal footing. And we think that's very important. I don't think we can go to a world where every piece of the internet is completely uncoordinated in many federations unsynchronized. But I do believe that uh, with a little more work, we can catch up our, our coordination mechanisms, make them more flexible, make them more adaptable, make them more open, bring some of the parties that may have been hesitant in the past, like government, bring them to the table, provide for the flexibility that's necessary so that governments can achieve their public policy objectives. But at the same time, we have to allow enough synchronization to keep the internet globally coherent and interoperable. And that doesn't take much, but it's gonna require conscious effort to maintain a base of interoperability uh, across the entire system. So um, I support, as I said, uh, the prior remarks regarding um, flexibility where possible, but I do believe there's a core of interconnectivity that's necessary if we're going to have something that's as valuable as the internet is today. Something to remember, if we truly could go to a completely federated internet, it would have already happened. Nothing has prevented people from running dark nets and private nets today but none of them have achieved the level of network synergy such that they're an economic and human development force like the internet. So the proof is that can be run today, but it doesn't necessarily get us the benefits that everyone sees with today's internet. And the benefits of today's internet 
are based on a base of global coherence that we desperately need to maintain. Thank you. Up since he was being directly addressed in that. Okay. Uh, Milton, you had some comments there that you put on the chat. Can you bring them up and put them into the discussion? Milton, did we lose you? Can you hear me? Yes, we are. We're good. I could I could raise Milton. it in my own call if you want to, but basically I wanted to ask Elliot some thought that um, when he talk, talks about a fragmented or, or federated internet, uh, whether this would not, in the current political climate, devolve into basically a nation state based fragmentation, and do we really want that? I think it would be, it's a good question, probably a combination. Can you ask? Start again. It is likely to happen to some extent, Milton. Uh, China probably will have it on a nation base. Uh, other countries will likely to have more companies or company coalitions. In other cases, a company would be transcend companies. For example, Telefonica, which is on the call here, um, or Telecom Italia might be in uh, um, multiple represented in multiple countries, although ne not necessarily um, everywhere. So, so it'll be um, a, a kind of relatively complex system. There's no question about that. Um, but. The advantage is that one does not have to reach agreements with uh, China or with uh, Saudi Arabia or with Brazil or whatever. Every country, every company can, in effect, do their own thing, although most likely they will be in coalitions with each other in some form. And I'd like to disagree with Ellie there because I think there would be a terrible price paid if the debates that are commercial cut some people off from the other networks. And I think it's really crucial to do the federated internet that we also have to make sure there's robust interconnection. So it's a good time to hand it over to an economist. Renzo Papilio from Telecom Italia has been in the middle of a lot of this for a long time. Renzo, do we have you? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. You're live and well. Okay. Very good. Uh, so thanks, uh, Elie, to David for this opportunity. And um, well, from what uh, Elie was saying, I will uh, take uh, my take that uh, uh, federated internet means uh, uh, basically flexibility. Okay. And uh, if uh, uh, to go back to the title of this uh, conference, is there a third way for the internet? We probably should say that at the moment, the train to some extent uh, left the Penn Station in the United States, but we we'll still don't know where uh, it's heading to, to some extent. Uh, uh, to give you uh, some hints, for instance, it's uh, the idea that uh, this topic is becoming more relevant. Uh, it's also present to some extent in the recent uh, consultation that the European Commission put forward. Uh, there was one section, you know, the, basically the uh, Commissioner Kroser didn't come to Bali, but she wants to be present on this issue during the Bali event. And uh, beside the video she put uh, uh, on the, her blog, uh, uh, she put forward a consultation. And, uh, among the question, on the, there was a specific section on the architecture matters, and uh, she basically was saying that uh, although uh, uh, you know internet should remain one single network or networks where every node can communicate with every other, she was saying asking, but there is nothing wrong with local original internet traffic being routed close to home. This makes sense both technically and economically. Okay, so I think will be will be very interesting to you know find out what is coming out of this uh, consultation. In other words, uh, uh, the idea that probably pro 
promoting different routines uh, can, uh, to some extent, it's coherent with the idea of having one, uh, one uh, single network. In other words, one uh, network should be still uh, uh, have some mechanism of interconnection among the different uh, uh, regions. Okay. Uh, going back to the issue of the flexibility, uh, I, I think, no, I see some positive uh, sign, you know, at this moment, because uh, uh, as I said before, the train to some extent left the US, uh, and we see the, the Montevideo uh, declaration. We see also, we saw this in Bali, but also in all the activity uh, from ICANN that um, uh, FADI is really committed, you know, to make much more uh, global uh, uh, ICANN, you know, to move, uh, uh, I would say, even some of the intelligence out of the US. I think this overall, uh, it's, um, it's quite um, important, you know. Uh, my, my, uh, you know, my suggestion will be that we should probably uh, work towards, uh, um, you know, st starting, in other words, starting from the existing institutions and uh, try gaining much more flexibility, try to accommodate uh, the fact that we have, uh, uh, you know, we have some um, uh, actor from the current uh, multi-stakeholder model to some extent whatever would, uh, would like to have uh, um, a broader role you know and uh, I think that this uh, the current multi-stakeholder model can accommodate that if we take into account the basic difference between the shared responsibility of the stakeholder and the equal responsibility in other words I think that we should make clear that uh, when uh, we work on governance issue, we should have uh, one phase in which uh, all the stakeholders uh, discuss the issues. And then when we have uh, identified uh, which one is the best uh, uh, institution, which institution is the best uh, to approach the, the different uh, issues, they should take the lead. In this sense, I think that uh, we can make clear the difference between shared responsibility and uh, and um, equal responsibility. And this should allow, you know, to have a much more flexible approach to, to the current uh, governance model. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for hitting the button that I needed to hit there. Uh, Fred Goldstein raised his hand. I think that's what they call it on WebEx. Fred, you had something to join in with? Yeah, I was going to note that it sounds like there is really a, a sort of a philosophical split between the federated view of loosely coupled networks that Eli ha brings up uh, and which seems to be the natural evolution versus the sort of centralized one internet, one authority model that others, uh, I think Milton and John would be examples of, of uh, supporting. So, you know, th this is this is sort of the central thing. It was how one governs is more important than the centralized internet model. Ellie is there saying yes. I don't know if it came across. And it's a strong sentiment. Before I lose Lorenzo, because he's an economist. I'm sorry? John, John Curran? John Curran has something to say. Let's bring him on. To note that, to be clear, um, the there's not a categorized or saying uh, advancing a a centralized model. I think the term that's used in the past, if you ran networks two decades ago, you might recognize it, is loosely coupled, but that's stronger than federated. In other words. Federated implies that there is a number of networks and there's mechanisms for interoperability. I actually believe we need to aspire beyond that. We need to have a number of networks whose mechanisms are interoperable. It may be their governance structures are multiply layered, just as um, 
uh, was alluded to earlier in um, Ms. Uh, Crow's remarks, it may be that certain governments end up with their own national structures for uh, governance models, but the underlying mechanisms for interoperability uh, really need to be provided if we're going to pick up the flexibility and the adaptability and the dynamic innovation of the internet. We shouldn't lose track of the fact that today we do have cases where there is truly gateways between networks, private internets and public internet, and those gateways don't know how to speak new applications. They have to be programmed for every new application. We don't want to replicate that internet-wide. So it would be good if the necessary mechanisms of interoperability were there. And what we're discussing is governance structures having a level of layers and diversity. I would suggest we may end up with a hybrid of the two approaches, uh, that what you're referring to is the big eye internet, which has a certain property and uh, a lot of applications that are suited to it. Uh, at the same time, there could be other internets that are federated, have looser interconnection that may not pass all existing or all new applications, but have other properties. So we could end up with a, a mix of the two and uh, where the weight of traffic is vary well, may vary over time. There are applications, after all, for which being part of a worldwide network is a disadvantage for security reasons. I'm thinking of like public safety networks that want to be very uh, carefully interconnected to the rest of the world. Anybody else want to come in here? In that case, since we don't have anybody raising their hands, let me bring on Alejandro. Before I do, let me introduce him a little bit. The question just went over the chat, where's Vint? And people made some usual amusing comments and so on. Vint is apparently traveling today. We invited him, and he was actually helpful setting this up, and he would have been more than welcome. So would have been folks from the U.S. State Department, the U.S. FCC, NTIA, Verizon, AT&T, and so on, all of whom were invited at the senior level and all of whom decided this was too much of a hot potato to talk about in public. I don't think that was Vince's problem. I think he was actually traveling. Now, the reason I want to bring one of those committees that somebody said Vint was off on discussing and plotting the future of the Internet, he certainly is not a spokesman for ICANN. But he is in the middle of a lot of things. So, Alejandro, do we have you there? We just lost Alejandro. In that case, uh, Milton, are you here? Milton's muted. So, hopefully, catch this and come back shortly. Uh, is that Milton or Alejandro? I couldn't quite hear. That was Milton. Uh, if Alejandro's here, I'll mute myself again. All right. Alejandro is reconnecting, so let's get Milton up here. Alejandro will come on after, and we still got Fred Goldstein behind him. Milton? Okay. So um, I was very pleased with the title of this uh, the webinar. I, um, the idea of a third way uh, with uh, neither the UN nor the US, but independence for the internet is something that uh, I've been advocating for a long time. And uh, it's a particularly satisfying to see that uh, option posed because uh, now people are talking about a different kind of a third way. Um, the, they're posing as the two options on one hand, multi stakeholder model, on the other hand, the sovereignist model. And, and uh, because of the summit that will be held in Brazil, or the meeting that will be held in Brazil, uh, people are talking about some kind of hybrid of multi-stakeholderism and intergovernmentalism, which is actually what ICANN has become with its governmental advisory committee. And I'm, uh, I think these hybrids are maybe uh, worse than the status quo. So uh, yes, third way means we need to talk about the independence of the internet from the system of national sovereignty. Now, you know, if you read my 
book uh, networks and states know that I've been advocating something called the denationalized liberalism. And that means that we need to detach the basic internet governance institutions from a uh, nation state and make them truly uh, self-governing, which also means that they have to be accountable uh, to some kind of a constituency uh, or group of people who are dependent on their governance. Uh, so, in some ways, I am toying with the idea of uh, what I call internet nationalism. That is, the idea that you're really not going to get out from under states for the internet until the internet community thinks of itself as a uh, self-consciously self-governing community and asserts its independence relative to states. And they have to be equipped not, not only with the technical understanding of the internet, which the Internet Engineering Task Force is very good at, and the regional internet registries, people like John Curran are very good at understanding the technical implications of governance, but they also have to have an understanding of themselves as a political entity, as indeed a, a potential problem for the entity. Um, so if you think of uh, sovereignty as somehow residing in the internet user globally, uh, your, your task then becomes one of somehow creating new transnational institutions that can govern the internet uh, that are rooted in the legitimacy and authority given to these institutions by internet users and suppliers uh, and not necessarily by states. So to what does this mean in the very short term in terms of specific proposals? Where do we go next? Well, let's just recall what has happened so far. We had the Montevideo statement, and then immediately after that, we had this announcement of a summit meeting, which has now been demoted to a meeting meeting in Brazil. And ICANN and the Brazilians are kind of uh, negotiating about what will be discussed at this meeting, what's on the agenda, and who will be at the meeting. Um, I don't put uh, a tremendous amount of weight on the Brazil meeting. I just think it's an interesting uh, departure from the, the uh, intergovernmental model. It, in some ways, it's an alternative to the ITU plenipotentiary as a way to discuss the larger issues. And so what should, what should we be discussing at that meeting and what should we be discussing generally? Well, I think it would be a mistake to get too uh, broad in our focus and talk about general issues of Internet governance. And in particular, uh, how can we control, you know, privacy? How can we regulate Google? How can we do this? How can we do that? I really think that in the short term, we need to focus on uh, the denationalization or privatization of the IANA function. As the, as the Montevideo statement suggested. And we need to concentrate on the reform of ICANN uh, such that it does uh, become more independent and also more accountable. And those are doable things. You know, we, we're not going to completely create a system of global internet governance or a system of federated governance at some meeting in Brazil or sometime in the next few years, but we can fix ICANN. And if we concentrate on that and if we have the right ideas about how to do it, I think we could accomplish that. So what we need to do with ICANN is we need to think about the very specific detailed aspects of uh, privatizing or, or delinking the IANA function from the U.S. government. The most sticky part of this is what do we do with VeriSign and the operational, uh, the authoritative root server that they operate. Uh, VeriSign does not want to be this function to be attached, detached from the U.S. government, by the way. So we have a bit of a political problem there. And then we need to talk about what this ICANN Corporation is detached from the U.S. government, uh, how do we make it accountable? How do we make it responsible? How do we make sure it doesn't go off by itself and become some corrupt or, uh, you know, autonomous entity that doesn't respond to anybody's needs but its own? And that's why I think you have to talk about 
certain process reforms, and in particular about membership in ICANN that makes it accountable to a, a, a global community that it's supposed to serve in a very direct way. So I'll leave it at that. I think I've used up my time and uh, look forward to further discussion of these uh, big ideas. Thank you. Jason, do we have anybody queued up who wanted to speak? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. The point that I wanted to make is basically the fact that um, why is my video not showing up? That's weird. Uh, but basically, the point that I was trying to make is is very similar to what uh, Milton was just talking about, which is we're glossing over probably the most important aspect that needs to be talked about in terms of who quote unquote controls the internet which is the DNS root servers, which is VeriSign, which is all of that. At the end of the day, every country can go off on its own and do whatever it wants to do, if it really wants to change from IPv6 to IPv12 or 14 or whatever, institute any kind of technology it wants. But if the root servers aren't pointing to their server, and if there isn't a standardized controlled director of some sorts, um, the internet is just not going to function. So you're going to just end up having fragmented, um, individualized little fiats, if you will, uh, where in their own world they have to do what they want. But China's intranet or internet or whatever you want to call it still will not be able to talk to the U.S. if they can't get into and, and understand what our DNS server is. And if we lock them out or if because it's not standardized, the two DNS servers don't work, there's just nothing there to be able to interoperate with one another. And there's no cloud operator that's going to be able to handle that. And, and in fact, we're already, already having that happen to a certain extent, and it was what the issue that blew up at Wicket when Iran and Cuba complained that their people were being blocked from many of the functions of the Internet by the international boycott. So this isn't just arbitrary talk. There's definitely a fear that things would split. Do we still have John Curran here? John, can I ask you to come in here and talk about what would be the practicalities of making and in, keeping an internet connected if we didn't have the current structure? Sure. Um, so I think the, the prior speakers have, have uh, addressed a little bit of this, but. At the end of the day, you have to look at each protocol and decide whether or not it's interoperating end-to-end -end or whether or not it's being gateways in a manner. Now, folks, we do know how to make gateways work. Uh, electronic mail, I ran a mail system in the several decades back, which spoke a lot of protocols other than just email SMTP, it spoke mail with UUCP and BitNet and a whole bunch of other protocols. It's possible for people to break off their own protocols or break off their own standards for how they manage the protocol yeah, and still right. maintain connectivity. The problem is that it limits the degree of innovation that you can have. So to the extent that someone is running their own DNS tree, to the extent that someone is running their own take on a file transfer protocol or on a web protocol, then you can't create new applications on that and know they'll work on day one. Does this happen today? It does. We have private networks. There are private networks that don't interconnect with the internet or at least don't intend to interconnect with the internet, um, which uh, exist as private islands out there. But if you want to get the huge economic and social change force that the internet is today, you're not going to be able to replicate it with a bunch of private islands. Uh, Fred Goldstein has his hand up. Yes, I just wanted to comment that I, I'm less concerned about that because gateways, not only are gateways possible, but may well be desirable and shouldn't be that difficult. If you had technological change going on, part of the technological change should be to come up with gateways to older technologies. In fact, this is something where IPv6 uh, was less than wholly successful. And so one, one can certainly posit uh, a more federated, loosely coupled 
network of networks approach where that which one wants to connect can connect. Um, the so you know it may it may well be necessary to do that uh, for any number of reasons, and so I'm just not worried that being on more than one network that was what the internet was about from, from day one in the 1970s. And if it means for some reason a country refuses to participate in a common route, well, it means you have a finger in that country's network on their route, and so be it. Um, it's, that's that's their choice, and it may not be on a country basis. Uh, Milton had his hand up. I'm, I'm re emphasizing something that John said, but I think I'm taking it a bit further, which is that uh, given the massive uh, network externality created by the interoperable central route, uh, it is unlikely, uh, just to follow up on Ellie's ideas, it is unlikely that anybody will break apart from that unless there is some kind of a radical split in technology. And the current internet allows for this federated system that we're talking about already. It's simply that people stick to this common route, not because it's impossible to create an alternate one, not because the system is not flexible, but because of the enormous value added by the global interoperability. And even countries like China, which, you know, don't like being exposed to the internet in certain ways, uh, simply cannot detach themselves from it because of the tremendous economic uh, value of having the global interoperability. Uh, Alejandro, are you with us now? I think Alejandro is still having connection problems. So Fred, let's bring up your presentation. Jason, can you get it up? Oh, excuse me, I just heard Bob Hinden has his hand up. Bob, for those who don't recognize the name, is the current chairman of the Internet Society. Bob? You. Can you hear me okay? You're coming, You're coming, You're coming through. through fine. Good. Um, the one thing I wanted to add to this, um, this, there may be some misunderstanding, is the current Internet is completely voluntary. I mean, the ITEF is, you know, a voluntary standards organization. No one is required to do anything that it says. Um, it basically says if you're going to do it, you want to do something and, the, you know, here's a way of doing it that will interoperate. But there is no, um, you know, it's unlike some, um, you know, governmental-based standards organizations that sort of require things. So, you know, the world we live in today, everyone does it, does it the particular way it's specified by the ITF because they want to. There's no, if, if there was in someone's interest to do it with some different protocols or build gateways to the current internet, and this happens to some extent already, they can do that. There is no, no one stopping them. This is largely driven by, you know, it's a very high bar to do something different, but there is no, uh, if it was in someone or group of people's interest, there's no one to stop them. And I think that's even true of the DNS of the root. You know, it's here's a way of organizing the one, the DNS based one. But if you wanted to do something else, you could. There is no, there is no governmental body or standards group who's saying to do this. So in some ways, we live in the world that um, I think Eli talked about at the beginning. It's just people have chosen to sort of do the same thing because it's in their self interest. John Curran had his hand up. John? I'm the Bob. Why will what? Uh, Bob, I... Hello? Yes, can, I, can you hear me? You're up. Very good. Uh, Bob, I agree with you, and I disagree with you. I agree with you that the Internet's totally voluntarily, voluntary, and that in theory, Someone can decide to not use a protocol, not use uh, a particular set of identifiers, but the reality is that once you're using it, and given the uh, large network synergies, um, if the policies change for how identifiers are managed, it's not feeling voluntary 
that you don't, don't have to comply with those policies. In other words, the threshold to leave an identifier set or to build your own internet is so high that I, while I recognize it's theoretically voluntary, I think there needs to be ex, um, exceptional sensitivity by the uh, internet standards organizations and the internet registries that their decisions, while in theory deciding on parameters of a voluntary system, the, the existence of the internet and its success means it's not as voluntary as one might think. I made this point in my city presentation a few months back, and I think it's important to keep in mind because it's not as much free choice as you might expect. Dave Bernstein here, jumping in quickly. I can't agree more with John Curran. I've been sitting here in an, at Columbia University, fine academic institution, saying this conversation is perhaps too academic in the worst sense of the word. That sure, you have theoretical possibilities of doing this kind of thing. Sure, there's no formal obligation. But in practice, the internet is so important to so many people that very few people are going to jump off and try to do it any other way. And I think we've got to stick in what I think of as the real world, but I've said my piece. Okay, I think we have Alejandro. We've got Fred Goldstein queued up after that. So uh, this is Alejandro Pisanti. Should I speak up? Please. Please. Alejandro in Mexico is a former member of the board of ISOC. He's on the current advisory committees of ICANN, and he's been in the middle of a lot of this for a long time. Uh, thank you. And I don't know if uh, Jason got my slides. Uh, I sent them by email. They're loading up now. Okay, excellent. So uh, I, will, I will start. Uh, thanks, Dave, for thinking of me for this uh, very, very important occasion. Uh, I'm very glad to, to, to speak. I'm speaking out of uh, Mexico City, the National University of Mexico. Uh, the internet governance uh, debate continues to, to, to evolve. I'll try to, to take it away from the, the, the bad academic side, uh, hopefully. Uh, the um, internet governance debate continues to evolve. I should mention that if we go to the first slide, please. Uh, uh, internet governance is uh, something that uh, reminds me sometimes of the piñata, which we use here in Mexico, and this is well known to the to people in the U.S. This is uh, something you put out uh, for kids in a party to hit hard with it and try to break. Uh, it usually contains a uh, lot of candies and nice stuff. Other times it's uh, spiked up with, uh, with nasty stuff as a, as, as a bad joke. Uh, internet governance is an important subject, but it's also brought out as a, uh, as a piñata often uh, when, when other stuff is not working or it's not attracting enough attention. Uh, the, uh, it, it has been there, for example, in, uh, as an issue when ICANN was constituted. It was like uh, the big thing happening in internet governance, and the true was but there's a lot of other things that need internet. Uh, they need some level of governance or, or lend themselves uh, to that temptation, at least. And uh, you can still uh, uh, not see as the, the same type of afro that ICANN has uh, brought up. Uh, internet governance became, again, a contentious issue during the World Summit on the Internet uh, on the Information Society, WISIS. Uh, WISIS was almost uh, going uh, smoothly uh, towards uh, the type of things you expect from a summit, very general resolutions, commitments without peace, governments promising, uh, as we say in Mexico, the pearls of the Virgin uh, to everybody without actually having to be committed to, to deliver anything. Uh, and then uh, the Digital Solidarity Fund, and most importantly, uh, the issue of uh, asymmetric presence of the U.S. In, uh, in the domain name system management uh, came up, brought up mostly by China, and uh, it actually uh, stopped the uh, stopped with in many ways. It stopped it from being effective. Uh, uh, in, in its first stage, we had to form the working group on internet governance. 
uh, came up with the IGF afterwards, uh, and, and it still is an open issue. Uh, so, uh, wait a minute, please. Hello, this is Alejandro Pisantes here again. Can you hear me? Yes, Alejandro. Yes, Can you hear me? Andrew, we're hearing. We have. Sorry, I, I, I have to dismiss a very nasty interruption here. Uh, so, uh, now we are again in a moment where interim governance has been put under the spotlight uh, as a consequence of the post Snowden uh, scandal. It's undoubtedly very large. I'm not going to dismiss it. But uh, I think that what we see a lot of the attention doing is that instead of governments uh, actually picking up on the issues of how to govern snooping, how to make agreements about how they uh, internally in their own countries uh, raise intelligence about their citizens, uh, snoop into conversations, survey uh, events, uh, use publicly provided information from Facebook and geolocalization and stuff, uh, to triangulate what uh, we, we have cynically accepted to be called metadata, which actually regulates the telecommunications data. And uh, we already see signs that uh, this, this was not a great choice by, by governments. For example, we saw Brazil very aggressively uh, uh, calling for another call of internet governance, yet uh, uh, the, the proposal that was made, the motion that was made last week by Brazil and Germany uh, for regulating privacy at the UN level doesn't even mention the internet except once in the preamble. Uh, so I think that uh, we, we, we should be very wary of where we have to go. Um, I don't think that we can establish one governance for the internet, but I would like to tease that question and, uh, and, and, and still leave it open. Uh, the way internet governance has grown up to now is not uh, very far from what Eli Noam has described as a federated uh, internet governance except it, it, it seeks more unity at uh, capacity of communication level. Uh, it has been bottom-up, it has been edge inwards, it has been focused on problems, we can call it a heuristic approach. It has been based very much on layers and it has made segmentation for needed. For example, some issues are recognized as legal, some issues are recognized as regulatory, uh, some issues are recognized as being behind national borders, and you have all that type of segmentation. Another important characteristic of uh, internet governance to date has been to parameterize it, where something is already being governed, where there's a law, where there's an international treaty, and so forth. For example, something as simple as a list of country codes, uh, two-letter uh, country codes. Uh, the uh, internet governance organizations and mechanisms have relied on those. As RFC 1591 says, we are from Ayana, it says, we are not in the business of deciding what is and what is not a nation. Uh, so you have some problems that have been put into track to be solved at least. Uh, the IETF is uh, a sort of standard development, IANA and the Nikon Central Identifiers Coordination. You have uh, other efforts like the Messaging and the Abuse Working Group or the Anti Phishing Working Group. You have intellectual property, for example, where you can't have one governor or one internet governor, even the, uh, the funny ways, for example, in which the US uh, mixes moral rights and, uh, and uh, commercial rights. You have human rights and they're abused. We have national and national regime, so it's hard to think that this will coalesce into one single uh, internet governance. Further, you do have a technical infusion. Uh, it still is very evolving and uh, uh, in, in, in many occasions revolutionary. Uh, and uh, one concern we have actually uh, in, in, in the people, among the people more related to a technical evolution and coordination is that social and legal constructs can try to mandate technology to do some things, but at some point they may actually tear the issue of the of this one internet. Uh, I don't think that it's uh, time, at least, for a single feeling or a single umbrella. Certainly, gov internet governance cannot work as a gearbox. As a gearbox, we may uh, see something more like a fish school kind of coordination, where each individual fish is looking for the fastest or slowest current, depending on its strength, uh, where, the, where, where the food's actually coming, whether they are in the middle of the stream or to the edges, or uh, whether they actually love eddies or run away, from, or, or let's say swim away from them. Uh, evolving mechanisms like uh, Eli Noam has been talking about, you need uh, uh, maybe some more concrete uh, definitions, see how 
they would work according to mission, according to effectiveness and the scalability. And when we seek scalability, we want to think uh, clearly about uh, what's the scale factor. Is it the number of people, is it the number of people connected, the number of computers, the number of things like in Internet of Things? Is it only countries or domain names or PLDs that are your scale factors? And uh, to finish, uh, the last slide, please. Uh, sorry, I didn't keep you uh, updating the slides. You can go to the last one. Uh, you have to look at whether any new mechanism for Internet governance, as has been the test, and it continues to be the test for every existing mechanism for Internet governance, uh, whether it scales and whether it works. You have things scale that work but don't scale, like small CCTLD management, which is basically a very technical and friendly operation. There's little commercial interest. Uh, they have a mechanism to deal with domain name collisions, domain name and trademark collisions, and they don't have a lot of work because they have a few thousand names. Uh, that doesn't scale when you want to scale a CCTLD to be a really large one like uh, .ee in Germany uh, with uh, several million names, then you have to have a uh, uh, appeal and regret mechanisms for these collisions. You have, you may have to go to litigation and so forth. So that you have to change the mechanism in order for it to scale to large. You have mechanisms that scale to large uh, sizes. For example, they seem to cover the world, like the ITU. But for internet governance, for most issues of internet governance, it really doesn't work. So if you want something that actually covers a lot of field in the internet and scales to very and and and, and works effectively. Uh, up to now, what we know is it has to be mission constrained, and there's a magic path which is hard and slow to build. Uh, it's not straightforward uh, to make this uh, scale and work, and that would be the best, I think, uh, or the design principle, design constraint, uh, to which we are looking with uh, uh, with with any any evolution. Uh, otherwise, there's no. I, don't, I, I think it's a, it, it, it's really a canvas kind of to 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 paint the continuous evolving internet and its uh, coordination mechanisms as uh, conservative. It's a uh, uh, it, it, it's a nice rhetoric trick, but uh, but it really doesn't cut a lot of muscle with the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, intern Alejandro. Does anyone in the audience want the floor for a moment? Speak up, please. Raise their hand by using the system. And if not, uh, we've got Fred Goldstein queued up. After Fred, each of the speakers will have a chance to sum up. And then we'll have Bob Atkinson summarize what we've been talking about. Again, we want your comments. We don't want to lecture you here. Uh, Fred? Oh, okay. I think it's your turn. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce my uh, presentation, Internet by Definition. Um, I think comments to Bob Hinden, thank you for the executive summary. I'm very much in agreement with what was said there. Uh, let's begin by saying what the Internet is. The Internet, big I, the Internet, is a prototype of an Internet, small i. There can be other Internets. They can use other protocols. The big I Internet, using IP version 4, will be the biggest one for the foreseeable future. That's the network effect. For some things, the network effect is important. But a generic internet can be defined formally. And I have this positive formal definition that an internet, little i, a voluntary agreement among network operators to exchange traffic for their mutual benefit. Now that explains how the internet evolved and how it actually works. So let's see how that plays out. An internet is a network of autonomous networks, and it helps to distinguish an internet from a cat net. There have been times the internet's been described as a cat net, but they're really two different things. A cat net is functionally a single network that has multiple owners. They have a common policy. The PSTN is a cat net, the telephone network. That can be modeled as beads on a spring. It doesn't have the functional layering. An internet, on the other hand, operates across multiple networks. It's a higher layer. It's not telecom. An internet runs above telecom. Traffic is relayed between nodes across whatever lower layer is available. 
And just to show how far back this goes, I brought in a, paper, uh, a picture from 1978, IEN 54, uh, the first published version of IP version 4. Uh, IP is that old. And it shows there's a, what was called a local network. doesn't mean a LAN. It meant the lower layer, X25, a piece of wire, whatever. Above that ran internet protocol, and above that ran the higher layer applications. So this is an old idea that internet runs above the network. It is not the network. An internet's a voluntary agreement among network operators. It's not a tangible thing. It's intangible. It's an agreement. Agreements here are bilateral. They're private contracts. They're not tariffs. They're not regulatory constructs. Those are not voluntary. Those are governmental. Internet is a bunch of voluntary agreements. The IP networks themselves are things, but each can have its own owners and its own policies. Therefore, users don't need to trust the network. That's the end-to-end -end reliability. That goes back to Louis Poussin around 1973 noted that. The lower layer networks, like the PSTN, are not party to these agreements. They're, they shouldn't be allowed to interfere with their internet payloads. We're buying transport from lower layers. They're not the internet. The internet, therefore, is best described as a phenomenon. It's empowered, but it's not created by regulatory protection. The regulators allowed us to use the networks. That's what made it possible. Mutual benefit. Internet providers exchange traffic for their mutual benefit. Again, that's different from the regulatory model of the PSTN. The network effect says that a bigger network is worth more than a smaller one, but the smaller network benefits more when it exchanges traffic with the rest of the world, so it may need to pay a bigger network. But it's also possible to buy transit or shop for a deal. It's not all bilateral like many PSTN tariffs require, so you can find, you know, work around the transport however it works. And therefore, there's not a bright line between a customer and a peer network. This is different from the PSTN. Again, in the PSTN, carriage is mandatory. There's universal connectivity. Carriers interconnect with each other at regulated rates, and they sell service to non-carrier customers. That's a bright line distinction that doesn't exist in the Internet world. The Internet is not common carriage. There's no obligation to carry anything. It's all for your mutual benefit. That's why net network neutrality, quote unquote, can't be imposed on an internet, or it's not even an internet anymore. It's just another regulated public network. Governments in an internet can't override the users. The ITU coordinates government regulated public networks. The PSTN and other public networks, like the old X25 world, those were public networks, rules apply to all carriers, tariffs apply. The internet is different. It's voluntary agreements and contracts. If the ITU or others try to hijack the route, alternatives could spring up. Users could adopt it. Non-free nations can and do create national quote-unquote internets that have limited connectivity. We all know about the Great Firewall of China and all the countries that want to block themselves and filter their connectivity to the world. It's their choice. The rest of us don't have to let them interfere with our activities. Users can even create another internet atop government-blessed local networks in that original term. That's how the original one happened, and as people have noted, there are already dark nets that prove the possibility. The internet is a phenomenon. If you get connectivity, you internet on top of it without the knowledge of the underlying provider. Therefore, the whole concept of governance is consultative. It's not actual governance. Public IP addresses need to be coordinated within an IP-based internet in order to avoid conflict. But pirate internet addresses do exist. There could be other internets with translating gateways and alternative protocols. Just as lots of private networks use private IP address space, one can use other protocols or other address spaces, as long as the gateways understand how to play by the rules on both sides. Anyone can point their computer in IP to any DNS name server. The ICANN route is a conflict-free option. If you use an ICANN route, you know what you're getting. But there are other routes. Those who choose to follow them can use them. Um, they're not very 
popular because the ICANN route does reach the most. But, uh, you know, even Louis Poussin himself, who essentially invented the Internet concept, ran his own route for a while. I don't know if he still does. Thus, other users and ISPs can choose to follow or ignore ICANN or any other governance body. It's not mandatory now. ICANN exists because people choose to use it. It is not governing, it's consulting. So beware the field of bad dreams scenario. Remember field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. Well, in the bad dreams, when you build it, they don't come. So can't create a governance mechanism for a voluntary network involuntarily. By definition then, the internet is not governable and that's why it works as well as it does. Chris, yes. can we get you some questions? Please. Folks out there, Fred has just said that, it's, that the whole discussion we're having about governance isn't necessary because the nature of the internet says it can't be governed. Anybody want to take them up on that? It's not my place as moderator to cut, jump in too hard into the discussion. Ellie's smiling at me. What's Ellie's thought? Nah, he's going to pass there. I'm, I mean, fundamentally in agreement with Ellie. It is fundamentally the same idea. Uh, hand up. John Curran has his hand up. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to respond. Um, do you hear me? I hear you. Very good. You're live and good. Um, so um, several decades back, um, there was uh, power companies that produced power uh, and transmitted power in different standards in the U.S. Um, in fact, you had the opportunity of having, in some cases, multiple power companies. We actually had the same thing with phone service, now that I think about it. You got to subscribe to your cat and net phone company, and you might need to have two phones on your desk. Um, these weren't regulated initially and became regulated. Your slides um, indicate that that which is regulated is definitely not the internet by definition. And I guess I'll, I'll assert that I support your conclusion. Um, a regulated internet may not have the users, they may go elsewhere. Uh, I don't think I support the concept that for that reason, people won't try to regulate. Well, I say people may try to regulate, uh, but that is Fundamentally, inim fundamentally inimical to the internet concept. There were now, of course, one of the problems, and I want to bring up those cases. Um, there was one big incumbent telephone company, and a little one before 1913 had no right of interconnection. AT and T, under antitrust, agreed to limited interconnection and created a nationwide network that the independents uh, in rural areas, at least, were allowed to connect to. Even today in Japan, there are 50 hertz and 60 hertz power grids operating in different parts of the country. Um, it's a problem for, inter for interoperability, although it is theoretically possible to have frequency converting gateways. So you know, anyone who posits a separate internet obviously knows that they are not intending to be fully connected to the uh, big I one. So the, the most public stuff would be on the biggest network, but things that don't need full connectivity. Uh, think of the history of things like ARING, the you know airline networks, banking networks that don't that really don't want full connectivity. They want maybe just a little control connectivity. That that would be an example of a private internet. Okay, uh, Milton has his hand up, but why don't I use Milton's interest to do the last round? Comments, summaries from each of the speakers. First, Milton, and then we'll go in turn with Ellie, who started, and so on. Comments from the audience after that. Sum up from Bob Atkinson, and we'll be done. Milton? Milton, you had your hand up? Yeah, good idea to combine. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're live and well. OK. Uh, I said it's a good idea to combine these all statements with my comments because, um, you know, it would be nice if we could uh, definitionally get rid of the threat of governance and avoid the threat of governance. 
I would uh, simply refer a friend to a paper I wrote in 1998 that made fundamentally the same point that he's making, <laughs> that internet, the internet was uh, a bunch of interconnected, uh, a protocol, nothing but a protocol for making uh, autonomously governed networks uh, interoperable, and that uh, we couldn't really govern that, but what we can govern are the institutions that uh, are required to coordinate this, which is why people are so interested in uh, ICANN and the IRR and other leverage points for acquiring control. And just to give you an example, um, you know, given the massive network externalities that make people converge on the single ICANN administered route, there are many, many examples of uh, people using that power of the network externality to regulate or govern uh, what internet users do, ranging from uh, imposing a global system of trademark uh, rights on domain name users to, um, well, for example, recently ICANN decided that uh, any new TLD operator would have to implement DNSSEC. The point is not whether you think that DNSSEC is a good idea. The point is that we're using the institutional leverage of ICANN to make an IETF standard mandatory rather than voluntary, as Mr. Hinden and Mr. Uh, Goldstein uh, think that the Internet is. So you have to be very attentive to the institutionalization process, the ways in which uh, governments and various interest groups can uh, position themselves to manage or control certain strategic points uh, that give them leverage over other things that people do on the internet. Uh, with that in mind, I would say that the the third way, getting back to the third way theme, I think I think I haven't heard a very much true engagement on that issue in the sense that nobody here is really defending or advocating that the ITU be, be involved. Um, I would say that I think uh, fears about that have been somewhat overblown because I don't see any way that uh, the ITU can take over uh, either ICANN or uh, the Internet's Engineering Task Force or any standards process unless you know, literally everyone involved wants them to, and that the real action, the real problem in terms of the threat of governance does not come from the ITU as an institution, but from nation states, and certain member states of the ITU are the ones that would like to extend its authority, and those nation states are really the, the problem, the fact that the world is organized around uh, territorial jurisdictions controlled by monopolies on the use of force, and that the, the serious answer to that is indeed the third way of independence for these internet governance institutions to keep them rooted in civil society, the private sector, the technical community, and to keep them relatively independent from the international politics that you get into when you're uh, governed by nation state. Okay. Uh, let's go through some of the speakers. Lorenzo, you have any thoughts you want to conclude with? Alejandro, you want to come back um, in with some thoughts? Uh, thank you. Mostly, I think that uh, we, we have to look at the context clearly. And uh, the, 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 I, th I think Fred Goldstein has done a superb job in, in, in explaining uh, what is and what isn't uh, available to be governed in, in uh, sort of a top-down uh, fashion or a single coordination, and certainly the internet escapes that. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I don't, I, I don't think that uh, people in the, the different uh, organizations and mechanisms are just sitting still. Uh, the opportunity uh, brought by the by the present crisis, if, if, especially if it really lasts and deepens, uh, is, is is great to to improve things to have. Uh, a shift in the relationship to governments and to intergovernmental mechanisms. Uh, as I said previously, I think that will have to be worked out 
uh, piece by piece. We're already seeing signs of that in ICANN. We're already seeing signs of that in the IETF, for example, which is doing a, a very interesting job in, in, in resetting the, the threat model uh, for, for the Internet at the uh, standard level. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff coming up. Uh, we certainly have to resist temptations uh, for, for easy solutions and make sure that they both work and scale as, uh, as we build. Thank you. Uh, Fred, anything to sum up with? Um, I don't have much more to say except it, it, it's an interesting set of problems that we have to uh, face. What is it that can be governed? What is it that people can and will do? And how do we distinguish between the traditional role of telecom versus the very different role of Internet? That while both are media of communications, tele uh, Internet may depend upon telecom, but they aren't the same thing. John, any final thoughts? Uh, well, then I'll go to Ellie for his thoughts. Picking up on is there a third way theme, um, I think it's it's clear that we know um, two ways that don't work, and so hopefully there is a third way between them. Um, the current mechanisms for internet coordination and cooperation don't provide uh, uh, a level of engagement that is wide enough or enticing enough for all the parties who might need to be at the table, including governments. Um, some of this is because of uh, lack of understanding. Some of it's because of concern of uh, currently a unique uh, relationship that one government has with some of these bodies. But in any case, we need to recognize that um, that's not going to, um, that that's not acceptable, and that we need to have more people at the table. On the other side, um, governments traditionally approach these problems by a multilateral mechanism. And uh, a multilateral mechanism um, has not been shown uh, to be something that can adapt as fast as the internet needs, um, and has been has not been shown to create something that is generally a light touch with a minimal uh, amount of control and regulation. Instead, multilateral mechanisms tend to be much more constraining, where the internet needs to be much more flexible and innovative. So we understand, as in the case of many problems, that the extremes don't work. Um, is, there, is there a third way? I believe there is. I believe there's a way to make it so all governments can sit at the table with everyone else and uh, be equals. I think there's a way to improve the sensitivity that the community has to the fact that governments feel important public policy mandates and uh, they feel that's a respective role for them and that they need to be heard when they're speaking with that. Um, and at the end of the day, it's possible we won't come to agreement, but at the end of the day, governments always have their national authority for pursuing their uh, policy requirements. So I'd like to think that we can work together in the vast majority of cases. I'd like to think we can provide a, a table that provides open participation for everyone, including all government. Um, and uh, I think that is the middle road. I think it's what was called for in the month of the day uh, I think I'm looking at Ellie now. Uh, thank you. I like, can you uh, mute it? Uh, just about everybody who is participating in this uh, conversation here or listens to it has been to various internet events. So we've heard lots of uh, levels of discussion and I have to say that this is one of the better ones that I've listened to or participated in it, partly because there was this absence of grandstanding uh, and uh, paranoia that often one hears in these events. Um, so, so I think partly because maybe because I agreed with so much of what was said, normally I disagree with someone, but now I agreed and I certainly learned a lot 
Um, and the terminology that we have is kind of nicely overlapping. I talk about federation, federalism, and somebody else said loosely coupled, which kind of goes in that direction, or the fish school, or other models, other ways of thinking about the same idea, which is how do we deal with the centralism versus the decentralism? The internet clearly has become a central institution, key institution in society and economy and culture and everything. And so therefore these things that we're talking about are really, really important. And uh, and who, who runs and controls and, and so on, and whether in fact anybody can or should or does. So what we've heard here is that uh, a lot of what is happening is anyway voluntary and advisory and people are doing this because they like to join. But in fact, if those network effects are so strong, and they seem to be, uh, then it means that whoever they're joining is a very in a very powerful position. So if we have an organization that in some fashion, and Milton also alluded to it, they gave the example of the uh, intellectual property type issues and so on, uh, there's a lot of influence and power in there, and if a central organization is in control of it, particularly if it is independent, as we kind of think are going to the, uh, in a third way, to an independent organization, to me the central question then becomes, how do we prevent this organization from being too, too powerful for its own good um, and becoming um, a, almost a mechanism for the insiders to control others? And so there are various ways of dealing with that. And uh, Milton uh, had the democracy concept, which is uh, people vote, uh, members vote. Uh, there is obviously some practical issues here of uh, people being delegated uh, to uh, put, uh, to join and to participate. So there are aspects of manipulation, but th those are practical issues. But the alternative alternative would be simply not to have such a centralized organization. And in some ways, one in some cases, if that doesn't happen by itself, maybe one has to take the next step and help create it so that there would be multiple internets with a cap, with a lowercase i. Uh, so I want to thank also the participants here, and then kind of cycle back to Dave. Ah, at least said practical, but I haven't been hearing very much practical in this discussion, and that's what concerns me. To me, the biggest problem on the internet is that five billion people have lousy internet connections. Most of them don't have any. We haven't addressed how to change that, and I think that does belong in this discussion beyond the theoretical definitions. We held off on the security, but that was deliberate. Columbia is going to address that in another forum. And we didn't address something that I think we need to address to make this conversation productive in the long run. How we show respect for the vast majority of people on the internet who do not live in the countries that currently exercise these institutions. And these institutions, while we talk about multi-stakeholder inequality, I'm in the middle of, and I've seen that those who have companies behind them that give them the time and the money and the travel funds have a wildly disproportionate influence on it, and that multi-stakeholder very rarely lives up to what we hope it should be. My two cents, and do we have Bob Atkinson ready to sum up and finish for us, Bob? Bob? Hello, summing up and uh, summing up. Well, first of all, I, uh, were there any further questions from the general audience before I try to do this summa summation? You see any? Yeah, Bob, I've I've asked them about four times direct and in the chat. No one has their hand up. Okay. Well, then I will try to sum up. Although, in some respect, it could be a very brief sum up because I actually didn't hear wildly uh, divergent or opposing views. Uh, it, the the differences amongst the speakers seem to be more of uh, degrees of centralization or federation, et cetera, but there didn't seem to be any uh, consensus or, or, or strong advocacy for more governance or more centralization of decision-making uh, for the internet. And in fact, the discussion seemed to be uh, revolve around, you know, uh, how uh, 
how the internet can move forward and evolve a system of either voluntary or uh, totally voluntary or imposed because of economic self-interest uh, rules, regulations, standards amongst the network operators. I actually thought one, one of the, the most useful uh, uh, contribution or way to think about this was uh, Alejandro's uh, graph uh, comparing uh, scalability to does it work and showing that the magic path on his graph was not straight uh, and was very uh, sort of not quite random, but certainly in order to get to a, a system that scales as the internet continues to grow and addresses the 5 billion users that they pointed out. And, uh, but it must work to essentially preserve the benefits of the internet. It, you, you, I think what he, the graph shows is that we are entering a phase of experimentation and there will be uh, a variety of experiments conducted by individual network operators, groups of network operators, government agencies might uh, uh, you know, throw various weights into the experimentation. But at the end of the process, if there is ever end, there obviously will never be an end in the sense of the process, but in the foreseeable, if we define the end as being the relatively foreseeable future, uh, we're gonna get there through uh, a messy muddling through process. Uh, so, uh, so the you know the federated in Ellie's uh, concept of the federated internet in, in implicitly involves I think muddling through amongst the various uh, networks that would be federated together. Uh, the uh, the other kind of experimentation that uh, we, we heard about also uh, uh, ongoing and the uh, very idea I guess of a of the ITU or having these meetings in, out of Monterey or Brazil, that's probably, I think, part of just a, an experimentation process. And because the internet is so powerful uh, and even more powerful in the future, I, I, what I think I heard was that uh, no one in the world is really gonna commit, you know, blow up the internet, it's too valuable. Uh, so the various stakeholders, governments, operators, users, et cetera, different national governments will be pushing and pulling, but not uh, in a way that will destroy the good. And uh, we'll end up with a constant, uh, an evolving process. I think some of the points that were made were particularly important though, that uh, you know, the, the, the process that we seem to have now seems rather slow and not fast enough to adapt to uh, an increasingly vibrant and large and important internet. So uh, to the extent there is either governance or voluntary parallel agreements amongst the players, we need to, the, the mechanism that works fastest uh, will probably be one of the most effective. So in fact, Alejandro's graph might need to be a, a three-dimensional graph with not only scalability and does it work, uh, as on two axes, but the third axis on how quickly does it work, so that that uh, the, the, the the timing of uh, of getting the uh, changes and, and various alternatives and proposals, uh, getting those moving more quickly, I think is probably as important as, as actually any particular governance uh, mechanism. Uh, I, I took voluminous notes of a, each speaker's uh, presentations. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, if anybody really wants to go back, it's, it's going to be this was recorded and certainly will be uh, made available on the internet. Uh, so I don't know that it's going to help be particularly helpful to try to uh, go back through each particular speaker's comments. So uh, I guess my my basic summary or synopsis of what I heard was. Uh, Internet governance is a, going to be a, an issue that will be around forever. There is no single magic formula that anybody today could uh, outline that will solve all these issues permanently forever because the, the Internet is too dynamic, still too young, 
Uh, and so that we all just need to become comfortable with a little bit of chaos, a little bit of controversy, uh, but assume in the long run that uh, self-interest will overwhelm any uh, instincts for doing stupid things. I'll leave it at that. And before we go, I've got to thank Jason Buckweiss, who would have a heck of a lot of work on his part. This wouldn't have happened. And Jolie McPhee and our other friends at the Internet Society who helped out with the stream. Thank you, everyone, and stay in touch via CITI Columbia. So long. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.